We go on now to model friction and develop a set of equations that properly describe its presence in a Newton's Law type problem. The graph here shows the typical pattern of events as one tries to push on something and one has to push harder and harder and harder and the object still will not move because of the force of friction. At the microscopic level, the roughness of the surface of the object we're trying to push is interacting with the roughness of the surface on which it's sliding, and that prevents its motion. Until at some point, these rough edges pass over one another, and the object breaks away. At this point, the force, which has been increasing, increasing, increasing from, from friction, suddenly drops, and we're able to push forward. And now there's a kinetic force of friction that is, is taking place all throughout the time that the object is sliding. During the time that the object is not moving, the net force on the object is zero. That is the force that I apply plus the force of friction balanced to equal zero and cancel. Otherwise we would not have the constant zero speed. And it's perhaps intuitive to us that once we finally get the object moving, it requires a little less force to keep it moving than it did to finally break it away. So that's why this graph actually looks the way it does, because it actually encapsulates in the data what is our everyday experience. That it takes quite a lot of force to get something moving, but perhaps less to keep it moving. If I were to draw a free body diagram, for example, of pushing a, a heavy crate, then at some object, at some time, let's say call it T1, when we're still trying to get the object moving, we might be pushing forward with some modest force, but the force of friction is pushing back on the same on the crate with an equal and opposite force. And the forces are balanced and nothing is nothing is changing in terms of speed. At sometimes T2, we're pushing harder in order to make the object start moving. And at that point the force of friction has to increase as well because we still haven't yet managed to make the object move, so the forces are balanced. Finally, at time period three, I am able to make the object move, and depending on whether I'm moving at constant speed or I'm accelerating, I might be pushing forward with some uh, force, and the force of friction is actually smaller at this time than at time three than it was at time two, because this is the point where the object is broken away and is now sliding. We model this behavior with a set of equations that sort of describe the macroscopic behavior of, of friction. At the microscopic level, it's important to, to think about a lot of details about the surface roughness and the area of the contact between the object and, and, the, and the surface on which it's sliding. At the mac macroscopic level, we tend to divide this process of pushing and getting something moving into two time periods. Before the object is moving, this dotted line right here, we call this the static per period of friction because static meaning the object is not yet moving. And the force of friction is described by inequality. Whatever it is in magnitude, that magnitude is less than or equal to uh, something called the static coefficient of friction times the normal force. And when it's equal to, not less than, but equal to, that describes this ma maximal value of the static force of friction. Once the object is moving and sliding along, we, we model the force of friction in another way, which is that it has a kinetic force of friction, which equals something called the kinetic coefficient of friction times the normal force. So the proper free body diagram in this case for this object might be that it's sliding on the ground with, and has some weight pulling it down, mg, a normal force point, pointing upward, which uh, is from the floor pushing up on the object, a backward force from friction, and a forward force that we might be applying as we try to push it forward. The fact that the force of friction is modeled as a coefficient times the normal force, uh, we'll see, uh, works out very well and goes with our intuition that the heavier the object is, the more difficult it is to, to make it move against friction. What are these coefficients? Well, they vary in value and it depends a little bit on what kind of object you're trying to slide on what kind of surface. 
So for example, when we're trying to slide wood on wood, the static coefficient of friction is between maybe a quarter and a half. The kinetic coefficient of friction is more like 0.2. Other things which are more rough, the static coefficient of friction can be as large as one, like glass on glass. But the surfaces really, really matter. So while steel on steel has a co static coefficient of friction of 0.6, when there's a little lubrication or grease, that coefficient of friction goes down to 0.09. This is why in our engines we have oil lubricating pistons which are moving very rapidly inside the engine. Still other interactions have an even lower interaction, uh, coefficient of friction, like a waxed uh, wooden ski on powdered dry snow. And fortunately, some things have a very large coefficient of friction, like a rubber tire on co dry concrete, for which the static coefficient is about 1.0. As I mentioned before, the, co the force of friction depends on the normal force. And if we're trying to move an object along at constant speed, we would model the backward uh, kinetic co force of friction as being balanced with the force that we're applying because we're moving at constant speed. And we would know something about this situation because the kinetic force of friction would be proportional to the normal force with that coefficient of, that's appropriate for this particular object sliding on this particular surface. But that same object could have a larger force of friction, and therefore a larger required applied force to keep it moving, if someone were to come along and push down on the, on the object. Even though the object has the same weight, mg, there's a downward force from our hand, let's say, and therefore to balance the forces here and prevent it from accelerating in the vertical direction, the normal force must be larger. And when the normal force is larger, then this force kinetic force of friction will be larger because it is equal to mu times n. And therefore, if you wanted to keep this object moving at the same constant speed, the applied force would have to be considerably larger to keep it balanced with the force of friction. This is why you'd want not to have to move a heavy couch with your little brother sitting on top of the couch because the little brother would be acting like the hand applying an extra force downward. It may also explain your intuition when you try to move something that's big and heavy, why it's sometimes advantageous to lift up on it a little bit, because that reduces the value of the normal force. 